welcome to Sunday School this morning. Can you please stand, turn your hymnals to page 560. We'll do the first verse. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Sing it out on the first. Life has purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be a child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. Amen. You may now be seated. All right, as we always do, right before Sunday school, we like to take a time to share with each other how the Lord has blessed us. You may be seated, sorry. Uh, what the Lord's blessed us with this week. Um, prayers for the week ahead. So if anybody has a praise or a prayer, raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Well, I am blessed that uh, Pastor Ed just came and moved me in. I was up till 4.30 this morning. My house is up, and I got up saying, uh, this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm just really blessed that everything went well, and you I'm don't, overwhelmed with joy. You don't have to look tired at all. And the first thing that's in my house is, um, I forgot to say, um, for all things, um, all things, all things of God are possible. I'm not tired, <laughs> but I'm here, praise God. Amen. Is it, uh, for with, for with God, God, all, all things, things are possible. possible. I didn't know if you are going with, uh, no, all, all things for all things that, all No, things I was are. thinking, like, all things work together for good. Yeah. Like, I thought you were going that way. Too. Yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, throw it all in, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, amen, yeah, it's always good to have help yeah. and look out for each other, amen. Um, any other praises, prayers? Or oh, my sister's always gone too. Sorry? My sister Sally is home too. Sister Sally's home. Okay. Sister Sally. All right. Amen. Any other praises, prayers? Yes, Samaria. Awesome, Bill and Emily, and thank you so much. My sister Sally is home too. Sister Sally is home too. She hurt her foot. Hurt your foot or your toe? Both. Both. Had a rough week. So heal your foot and toe. God's big, God's the God of little things and big things. Amen. Yes. I need a translator. Help us to be good. Help us to be good. <laughs> Praises, prayers, Brother Justin, you got one? Uh, I, I don't have one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess prayers, I'm applying for graduate school. So graduate school. Uh, get a, <clears throat> the admissions will go well. I'll get accepted. They got a high acceptance rate? I think so, yeah. Okay. For the places I'm applying to, so. Okay, okay. That's a good prayer, yeah. Yeah. All right, um, I have a prayer, too. Uh, our daughter, Julissa, she's going through a hard time. Uh, nasty people just trying to use the legal system in their own way to kind of take advantage of people. Mm. Long story. We don't have time to go through it right here, but uh, definitely pretty, pretty sad. We're going to be praying for her um, that she would come out of that. Um, unscathed. <clears throat> and um, uh, I got another. Oh, yes. Sorry. Go. No, you go ahead. Oh, wait. No, you go. That's no, good. no, you go. <laughs> um, praise the Lord. Uh, my wife, so uh, Sergeant Heather, my father-in-law, right? Yeah, my father-in-law, her, her parents um, had their vow renewal on Friday. That went well. We survived. All my kids were in the wedding, so they they stayed clean before the pictures. <laughs> Praise the Lord, it all went smooth. Yeah. And now we can rest. <laughs> rest Amen. Yeah. Um, my mom, she lives in Florida, and um, she has an injury at work, and she's unable to work now. And, and she's trying to figure out her life is all swollen and everything like that. So just pray that her life is beyond that.
praise too. Um, really good one. Uh, let, I know yesterday we went out and soul went in. Uh, we saw a person get saved. A lot of seeds, a lot of good conversations and everything like that. <clears throat> but I had a really good one. I wanted to share it. Um, I was with Brother Justin. We knocked on this uh, young lady's door. And um, she was uh, probably in her 20s, somewhere like that. For some reason, every time I looked at her, I kept thinking of my daughter. She's about that age. And um, asked her about heaven, hell, what's next after this life. And she had mentioned that um, she wasn't sure she believed in spirituality, that there was a higher power. She's open to hearing other religions, but basically she just thought when we die, that's it. We're done. She seemed kind of, she said in a kind of depressing way. You know, it didn't seem very hopeful, which it's not. But um, anyway, we, we, we asked her if we could show from the Bible, what the Bible says. And she invited us in very quickly, which was, you know, always very nice when people actually invite you in. And we sat down and started talking with her and uh, going through the plan of salvation. And she was uh, very uh, attentive to listen. And um, didn't have a hard time convincing her. She was a sinner. Uh, most people are pretty understanding that that's a fact. <laughs> if you're going to look at someone else and call them a sinner, we do the same things. It's not that hard to connect those dots. But she didn't have a hard time with that. Uh, North understanding the Bible does talk about hell. And um, she had mentioned at that point that uh, she had been to a lot of churches. And she would go to one service. And she said, I would go in there, and I just want some answers, because I just don't know. And she'd go in for one service, and she said she'd leave, because she didn't get it. And um, that struck me at a point, too, because it's like, well, you know, God sent to you somebody today. Even though you went looking yourself, God still loved us. He sent her, sent us to her, this church, and specifically Brother Justin and I, and everybody that we talked to about the gospel. But um, I will share this with Brother Justin. But um, I took a second to notice that she reminded me of my daughter. And I remember a time that I was praying very much for my daughter to be saved. And that God would send somebody to her other than me. Because so rarely uh, those that we know are easy to witness to. Right. And so um, I was I, at that moment in the middle of the gospel presentation, though, I thought, uh, somebody's praying for this girl. Somebody's praying for everybody. Everybody in this world has got a broken heart about something, and almost all parents love their children, and they're praying for them in some way. They don't want them to see bad things to happen. And I mean, I don't know this girl's situation. I don't know who's praying for her, but I'm like, somebody's praying for her. If not, God's praying for her. Jesus is. We know that. And I thought, you know, it's why it's so important when we give the gospel, like, somebody's been praying for this person, and you're there now giving them the gospel. And this is it. This is the moment they've been praying for. And it's so important that when we give the gospel to people that we take it very seriously. Because it's so very important. And uh, that's not really, a, that might be a nerve-wracking thing, but at the moment I was thinking, what do I tell her the most? And it's about the love of Jesus. Tell them how much Jesus loves them Amen. through what he did for them. And focusing and emphasizing that so much, especially the cross. And it made a difference. And uh, in the end, she accepted Christ as her Savior. And it was a really good one because after the prayer, her face was kind of glowing a little bit with a good smile, which is, um, it's always very encouraging when you see people get it and they're happy and joyful about it. But um, it was something that made me remember to always think of that every single person that we run into, somebody's praying for that person. Somebody wants that person, whether they know it or not, to be saved. They want better things for them. And so at that moment when we give the gospel, we should always be mindful that uh, this is it. It's very important. Prayer to be answered, if not by Jesus, by loved ones as well. And so um, that's a praise and a prayer. <laughs> always to always have the right focus when we go out soul winning. Amen. Amen. And uh, that was mine. Do we have any other praises or prayer requests before we take these to the Lord? Yes, ma'am. Yesterday.
not selling something, you'll be okay. Salvation is free. As long as you're not selling something, you'll be okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm not selling well, it's free. Uh, it's it's free, free. That's right. Amen. Yeah. First thing to always do when you move in a new place, let everybody know you're the crazy Christian person. That's right. Amen. Good. Amen. Good. That's always the always good thing to do. Yeah. Amen. I'd rather be, I like to be that person. Might as well. They'll think you're crazy anyway. So might as well just be crazy for the right reasons. Amen. All right. Well, uh, if there's not any more at this time, we'll take these to uh, the Lord in prayer. So bow our heads. We'll pray now. Lord God, Father in heaven, we thank you that you brought us all here safely today <clears throat> to hear from our pastor a lesson, Lord, to strengthen our hearts and our spirits through the week that we have ahead. Lord, and we want to lift up praises now for the, all the prayers that we've had answered this week from our brothers and sisters, Lord. Uh, Patty's move with her and the help from our church to help her to do that, Lord, to, to see that process through, Lord. And I know that's sure is nerve-wracking, and it's always so peaceful once you're through those things that are on your minds and your hearts that press it, Lord. And we know those uh, the peace comes from you, and um, our brothers and sisters, we come from you to each other, Lord. We thank you for that. Um, and we thank her that her sister Sally's home, Lord, that you saw that through to deliver her um, back to her home, Lord. And also we uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, that uh, Brother Sergio and Heather had their vow renewal and that everything went well. Um, you know, there's a lot goes on in that. And Lord, I'm sure you oversee so many things, especially uh, children and uh, when they have a part, having their place in the part. And Lord, you're a God that oversees all these things. Strengthen our faith in that, and we thank you for that. And pray for Amanda's mother uh, that was hurt, Lord, and uh, not able to get to work. I'm sure it's very stressful. Give her peace in her heart uh, to know that God's that you're that you're over there and you're watching her, and that you'd heal her so that she could um, take those stresses off her, um, Lord, and uh, to return to work. As I'm sure that's what she's looking for. And Father, we want to lift up new prayers this week to you, Lord, that you'd hear these prayers and answer them, Father. Pray again this week for Samaria's reading, Lord. Continue to grow her and develop her little mind. Heal her foot and her toe, Lord. <clears throat> You're the God of big things and little things. I pray you just heal her toe and that she'd know that God did it. And um, help us also to always be following your commandments and obeying your word, that we'd be a righteous and a good servant, Lord, as you've commanded us to do. Oversee, please, Father Justin's uh, trying to get into graduate school and advance his career, Lord. Uh, I pray that your hand would be upon that. And that he'd see it opened and that he'd know that you're the one that did it. Pray for my daughter, Julissa. We all lift up prayers for her, too. Um, that those people that seek to take advantage, especially of your people, Lord, that you would um, judge that situation, protect her, and that your ju righteous judgment would be done. And that it would be perfect and that um, you'd strengthen her faith in you to seek after you, Father. And um, again, and help Patty to be a witness to her neighbors, Lord. Give her the courage and strength. Uh, to us uh, to let everybody around her know that there's a savior and that he loves them and that he's the king and that he's looking for him lord and we pray that you'd help her with that and help us all to reach out to our neighbors and always be a witness um, that you've commanded us to do in love and in joy and father we thank you so much we thank you for the lesson you have ahead of, for us give us hearts ears and um, to be attentive and uh, seek understanding we ask all this and pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, good to see you, Brother Andrew. <clears throat> all right. Well, let me grab my Bible. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. God has been good this week. <clears throat> Our cat took a little vacation yesterday for a couple hours, <laughs> and I did pray that he would come back um, for my wife's sake and... Uh, my kids sake and a little bit for me too um gives me peace of mind knowing my wife um has somebody to keep away the rodents from our house and uh, she has a fear of those um but the cat came back we were it was past dark it was like an hour past dark and still no cat and then samaria comes and says hey dad i hear something meowing from outside so i go out in the backyard and sure enough the cat was back <clears throat> uh, didn't want to come inside had to like reach under our shed and grab it and pull it out but uh praise god the cat um, we do have this morning for the young ladies, Miss Sadie, Miss Lena, Miss Mary Myra, um, a ladies' class. My wife has a ladies' lesson for you guys, for you girls. So if y'all girls want to go with my wife to the back classroom, um, y'all can do that now. All right, grab your Bibles for everyone else, all all of us old people in here. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not old. 
Now you're not old. You're still very, very young and sharp. Oh, old old spirit. <laughs> if you all the young ladies, go, go ahead and go with my wife. And, uh, so let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. Had a great day, someone in yesterday. Had a good crowd that came out. I appreciate everyone who came out. Um, just a great, great time yesterday. Good time also. In Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> let's see. There we go. And as you know, we've been going through the Old Testament, went through Genesis, the stories of all the, what they would call the patriarchs. You got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then you got the 12 tribes of Israel, Joseph, who moves into Egypt. The family follows him into Egypt. They're in Egypt. Does anyone know how many years the children of Israel are in Egypt for? Four? Yeah. Three. What were we going to say? Oh, like 3,000 years. 3,000? That's wrong. <laughs> that would be a long time. Uh, <laughs> So they were in Egypt for 430 years, and to the day, which is really interesting, the same day that they came in is the same day they went out, but 430 years later, and God delivered them. We went through all the plagues last week, because along, along came a guy named Moses, and we know Moses uh, is brought up in Pharaoh's house. Well, when he becomes 40 years of age, he goes to visit his brethren, the Israelites, and he uh, sees an Egyptian uh, mocking or uh, really giving a hard time to one of his uh, friends, uh, one of his uh, Hebrew brothers, if you will, and he raises up his hand and he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Well, of course, the Pharaoh finds out. Moses runs for fear of his life to the backside of the desert, and he's there in Midian for 40 years. Moses is now 80 years of age. God comes to him and speaks to him out of the burning bush and tells him, hey, I'm going to use you to deliver my people out of Egypt. And Moses says, well, Lord, I can't sp speak. I have a, a stutter. I uh, have a speech problem. And God says, no, I can still use you. He says, well, what if they don't listen to me? He said, here's a staff. Throw it down. Look at that. It turned into a snake. He said, okay, put your hand in your, in your suit coat here and uh, pull it out. And your hand has leprosy. And then put it back in and take it out. And the leprosy is gone. God gives him signs. God gives him Aaron to help him as well. Hey, Luke, come over here, buddy. Come here. You're not going with the ladies. Come sit down. Quick, 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 quick. And um, so God uses Moses to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. Well, he goes back to Egypt. The Pharaoh, of course, doesn't want to let his people go. And you have the famous statement. Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go, right? And so then, because Pharaoh does not want to deliver them and, leave, and let them release the people, because, you know, that's pretty much free forced labor, right? And uh, they, they were building things for him. Well, God sends plagues, uh, and you have the, the, the tw uh, ten plagues where the rivers turn to blood, the plague of the frogs, the plague of the lice, the plague of the, the, plague of the flies, the plague of the cattle. All the cattle died. Um, now, then God sent boils, boils on all of, of the men, and then God sent hail and fire mingled with the hail. Then God sent locusts. And then God sent darkness for, for a whole day, pitch darkness for, for three days, actually. And then the last plague was the death of the firstborn, which also coincides with the Passover. We're going to look at that for a little bit this morning. Passover, we didn't we got in a little bit last week, but not completely on it, so I want to go over that. And then after the Passover is the departure of the children of Israel out of Egypt, and then they get to a place called the Red Sea. And that's where we'll end up today is that Red Sea crossing. That'll be next week. Um, the Red Sea is an amazing story, and so we'll leave that for next week. So we're there in Exodus chapter 12. Um, look, look in Exodus chapter 12, verse number, uh, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So they would take this lamb uh, on the tenth day of the month. 
and they would keep it until the 14th day. So from the 10th to the 14th day, they're watching this lamb. They're making sure that there's no spot or blemishes on it, that it's as perfect as they can get it, and it's a perfect lamb. Now, why is that? Well, that's a representation of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrificial lamb. There was no sin or guile found in Jesus Christ, and this is a representation of the final sacrifice of the lamb, Jesus Christ, um, which is prophesied throughout the Bible. So interesting. Because you talk about, uh, you go all the way back to Adam and Cain and Abel, right? Cain and Abel were supposed to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. Well, who told them to bring a sacrifice to the Lord? How did they know what to do? Um, Cain brought a sacrifice of the fruit of the ground, of what he had planted in his crops. And Abel brought a lamb, a perfect lamb, to sacrifice to the Lord. And God was pleased with Abel's lamb, but not with Cain's sacrifice. Cain got upset, rose up, and killed his brother, right? Well, God had told them and taught them through Adam or told them specifically that, <coughs> excuse me, that they were supposed to bring a lamb. It wouldn't make sense for God to get upset at Cain if Cain had no clue what he was supposed to do. No, God, how did Abel know how to bring a lamb? Like, he didn't just guess and get it right. No, God had told them what they were supposed to do. And that precedent is set all the way back in, you know, the, whatever that is, the fourth chapter of Genesis there. And, um... Also, you look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac go up to the mount, and Abraham is going to sacrifice his son on the altar. Well, as he rises up his hand with a knife to slay his son, God speaks to him out of heaven and says, Oh, y'all hear that? <laughs> we got some, somebody living in the roofs. Uh, uh, anyways, um, uh, so uh, he raises up his hand to slay the knife. God stops him. That was God stopping him, by the way. He was saying, Whoa, hold on. And God speaks to him out of heaven and says, hold back your hand, don't slay your son. And then what's interesting is as they're climbing, going up to the mount, what does, Moses, or what, does, excuse me, what does Abraham tell his son Isaac? Isaac's like, Dad, we've got wood, we got the knife, we have things for the fire. We have everything we need for the, for the sacrifice, but we don't have the sacrifice. What does Abraham say to his son Isaac? He says, God will provide himself a lamb. And it's interesting wording there. That's what Abraham says all the way back in Genesis. And on the cross of Calvary, God provided himself a lamb. And that lamb was Jesus Christ. And he gave of himself. And so as he raised up his hand to slay his son, God stops him. And then uh, Abraham looks over. I keep saying Moses because we're Moses. Excuse me. Abraham looks over. And what does he see in the thicket? It's not a sheep. It's a ram. Right? It's not a lamb, but a ram. And uh, he goes over there and he sacrifices that because the lamb hasn't come yet. And that's when Jesus Christ dies. And so the, the, that, uh, the picture of Christ is throughout the whole Bible. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. All the way back in Genesis, the lamb being sacrificed is about Jesus. That's a picture of Jesus. Uh, here um, is also a picture of Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. And so we see that here in this story. Look down at verse number 7. Very important verse here. This is on the 14th day of the month. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In verse 7, God tells us that the blood had to be applied. Okay? Jesus Christ is the Lamb. He did die. But unless his blood is applied on your account, on the doorpost of your heart, and on your sin, on your house, if his blood's not applied, it doesn't do you any good. Jesus Christ died for the whole world. His blood is enough to save every person that ever existed. Mm -hmm. But not everyone will be saved because they have not applied that blood onto their account. So we see the deliverance of Israel is likened unto salvation. As they're delivered from Israel, it's a picture of salvation. Egypt is a picture of sin. The uh, 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 Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. And the Passover here is a picture of of the cross when Jesus Christ died on the cross um, and so you see that with Passover the blood has to be applied Jesus Christ's blood was applied on the altar in heaven and you see that talked about in the book of 
Hebrews, I believe. <clears throat> um, and so Jesus Christ did have to shed his blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So we see in verses 1 through 6 that there's the preparation for the sacrifice. Preparation for the sacrifice. It had to be a perfect lamb without spot or without blemish. It had to be the right sacrifice. Okay? Some people want to be saved by going to church and getting baptized. But that's not the right sacrifice. That's a, it might be a good thing, but that is not the right sacrifice. This, this had to be a lamb, and then it had to be a perfect lamb. It had to be without blemish, a male of the first year. You should take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So a one-year-old lamb or a one-year-old goat, without blemish, it had to be a male. Why is God that specific? Well, because it had to be the right sacrifice. Right. Not any sacrifice would be acceptable or suffice to pay for our sin. The only sacrifice that could pay for our sin... So there are two ways you can pay for your sin yourself, either by dying and burning in hell for all of eternity or by trusting in the price that Jesus paid on the cross at the final sacrifice of the Passover, um, the picture of the cross representing the Passover. Um, so we see that in the first few, six verses. We see that the blood must be applied in verse 7. So the right sacrifice has to be applied to the right place. Okay, I might want to get saved for... Somebody else, somebody I meet on the street. And I can say, Lord, I'm going to pray all night and pray that you save that person, and I'm going to do it for them. Well, I can't. Mm -hmm. So it has to be the right sacrifice, and it has to be applied at the right place. It has to be applied on their heart and in their life and on their mind um, and on their sin. My, uh, Jesus' blood has been uh, applied on my house, on the doorpost of my house, onto my account. But everyone has to do that for themselves. You can't do it for somebody else. And the right sacrifice has to be applied at the right place. And then it has to be applied the right way. In verses 8 through 10, it talks about them eating the Passover. They had to eat it, roast with fire, unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They couldn't eat it raw or with water. They had to eat it uh, cooked in the fire. And there's a certain way that they had to eat it. They couldn't let it remain until the morning. If it did, they had to just burn it. Why is that there? Well, the right sacrifice must be applied at the right place in the right way and that's the process that god is setting up here and so for someone to be saved they have to have the right sacrifice it's not it's not uh paying the church to uh you know pray for um your dead uh grandma that's passed away and paying them for the priest to pay pray for them out of purgatory into heaven right and that that's what people believe it's called indulgences and they would take money you pay us the church and i'll go and i'll pray for your dead relative and I'll pray that God takes them out of purgatory and into heaven. And, and they collect money on that, which is, is crazy, um, which is not anywhere in the Bible, first of all. But um, it has to be the right sacrifice, Jesus, is, Jesus Christ and his blood. Then it has to be applied at the right place, on the doorposts of our heart. If we just outwardly, there's people that will pray, Lord, save me. Um, but they don't believe in Jesus. They're just doing an outward show. And it has to be there, believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth, those two things. So it has to be applied at the right place and in the right way. <clears throat> the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. And so those three things have to be there. And that's why there's so much detail about the Passover, and that's what the picture is there. The blood must be seen. It, uh, without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That blood had to be applied. And we see that there. Look down in verse number 12. Exodus 12, 12, for I will pass, for I, I circled I in my Bible there, the Lord is saying, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I am the blood, and the blood shall be, uh, I am the Lord, excuse me, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Does that sound familiar? When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. And that's a song that we sing. comes straight out of God's word here in Exodus 12, verse 12, uh, 13, rather. And so when Jesus, uh, uh, the, Christ, the Lord came down, and he went through Egypt and smote all the firstborn, okay? Now, it calls him the angel of the Lord. When you see in the Old Testament, a lot of times it says the angel of the Lord. It's actually the Lord there appearing in person as an angel, as a messenger. It's a uh, Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And there's a technical term for that uh, where they 
say it's a pre-Christ appearance of Christ before uh, he was born. Because the Lord's been, you know, Jesus has been through, here through all eternity from the beginning. Um, wherever the earth was, God's always been here. Jesus has always been here. And so it's an appearance of Jesus Christ here. So he goes through the land and he smites all the firstborn of man and of beast. Can you imagine? Every house, every house, the firstborn is dead. Every uh, house, the firstborn of the cattle is dead. Um, there was a lot of uh, pain going on that night. Look down later on in the chapter. Let's see. Where's it at? Um, do, 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 I think it's – okay, there it is. It's in, uh, in chapter 12. Look down in verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. A lot of people died that night. And that was the Lord's judgment on Pharaoh and on that people. And, uh, you know, people will read the Old Testament and they'll say, why did God judge the people this way? Well, the Lord's the perfect righteous judge. Um, we can't question his judgment. We just trust his judgment. Um, he'd given them chance after chance after chance. He sent all the plagues. Uh, Moses and Aaron were there. Um, they had had all the chances to let them go and to follow God, and yet they didn't. And so this is God's judgment coming down, and in a way it's coming down pretty hard. And so after this happens, uh, Pharaoh's pretty much like, y'all just get out of here quick, because if you don't get out of here, we're all going to die, right? Um, every house, someone has passed away. And so they pretty much chase them out of the land. Look in chapter 12 there. Look down in verse number 40. And we mentioned this a little earlier. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. For it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So they leave Egypt and its men exactly 430 years. And there's a lot more in that chapter where it talks about uh, more of the Passover and uh, you know it talks about strangers or people not from the land of Egypt if they're traveling through they can under certain conditions partake of the Passover um, but they have to meet certain conditions and so um, it's a representation of anyone can be saved anyone can partake in the Passover um, they just have to come to the Lord with a willing heart and an understanding of the gospel trust and believe in him and they can be saved um, it doesn't matter what color you are uh, what race religion ethnicity it's all one race anyways, the human race, praise God. And so that is the representation of the Passover, which is a representation of salvation and the cross. So we see the preparation for the sacrifice it has to be the right sacrifice at the right place, applied to the right place, and in the right way, in God's ways. It's amazing how the Lord does things in threes. Throughout the Bible, you find things happening in threes. It's, uh, it's a... It's a number of perfection or completion. The Lord, the Godhead, is in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God created us as humans with a body, a soul, and a spirit in threes. Throughout all of creation, things happen in threes. And so that's God's number of, of the Trinity or unity, if you will. Um, look over in the next chapter, chapter 13. Look down in verse number 17. Chapter 13, verse number 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people throughout, through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So God doesn't lead them straightly, directly to where he wants to go. And in our lives, that's sometimes how it is. Sometimes we say, Lord, this is where I want to be, right here. And God says, okay, but I'm going to lead you around about this way. Now, why would God do that? Well, God knows that if we see war, we can be turned back and disheartened. And so God has a plan. Sometimes in our lives it seems like, man, Lord, you're making me do a detour. What's going on here? Lord, um, I'm supposed to be planting a church in Chesapeake. Why are you sending me all the way up to Hampton? There's a long detour around here, right? Um, the Lord has a plan and a purpose, and God knows best. The Lord knows better for us than we do. Um, I don't want to be in the control of my life making my own decisions because most of my decisions are probably going to be bad, right? 
We want the Lord to guide us and make those decisions for us, and we just follow him. And so sometimes God has detours in our life, and that's okay. God knows he lead, as long as it's God's leading. If we say, Lord, I know you want me to go that way, but I'm going to do my own detour. Okay, well, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Here it says God led the people about. Detours are not bad if God leads them. But if God doesn't lead them and you say, Lord, I know, I know you want me to uh, go and conquer this mountain like Caleb, but I'm not ready for that in my mind, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break. I'm going to go do this detour. Well, that's an excuse, right? And so make sure it's the Lord leading you. A lot of times we can say, well, God opened this door for me, and sometimes it's just us opening the door ourselves. And so I can't tell you exactly what God's will is for you other than what's in Scripture. I know you're supposed to go soul winning, supposed to be saved, supposed to live a righteous, holy life, supposed to please God, supposed to pray, and God will lead you specifically. But I can't tell you, Brother Justin, you're going to be part of Prince of Baptist Church till the day you die. I, I don't know that, and I can't know that. But God will reveal to you what his specific will is for your life. And the same thing for all of us. As long as we're sensitive to the leading of God, he will lead us specifically exactly where he wants us, when he wants us, how he wants us, and his perfect will for us. God doesn't magically tell your pastor, Miss Patty, I know exactly what the will of God is for you. I don't know. I can help lead and guide you for you to find it. See, and that's how God works. And so make sure that you know it's God's will and it's not yourself doing a detour. If God leads you about, that's okay, but make sure it's not yourself and don't use that as an excuse. And so God leads them about um, through the way of the wilderness and through the Red Sea. Um, this is also a representation, I mentioned it before, of the Christian life. Um, the uh, deliverance from Israel was salvation. The Red Sea, you can look at it as baptism, although they didn't get wet, but it can be a picture of baptism, right? And then um, the wilderness and, and living in the wilderness and into the promised land is the Christian life. And sometimes God leads us, sometimes we feel like we're in a desert. And uh, even in the desert, though, God has provisions for us. He's got manna from heaven. He's got water from a rock. He's got shoes and clothes that never wear out and that grow with us. God has all these provisions for us. So God leads us about. How does God lead us? He leads us in different ways. God leads generally and specifically. So God will lead a man to lead his people, pastor. That's always been God's plan. You see Moses, you see Aaron, then you see Joshua, you see all the prophets and the judges. God leads a man to lead his people. And then also, God leads individuals through his word. We all have access to God's word. We all can get the instruction and leading of God's word straight from the Bible. You don't have to come to pastor to, uh, to find out what God's word says. No, it's right in God's word. You can find it for yourself. But then generally, God will lead his people through his man and through the pastor. And that's always been God's plan. So he leads generally and he leads specifically. Um, look in, let's see. Okay, we're right there. We were in chapter uh, 13. We're in verse 18. Look at verse 19. Interesting thought right here. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Now hold on. If they've been there 430 years, these are some old bones, right? Well, the Egyptians knew how to embalm, and some of the bodies of the Egyptians are still uh, around today because of the processes of, that they did to mummify them and all that stuff. How are you doing? Good to see you again. Um, and so he takes the bones of Joseph with him because it was a prophecy. Keep continue reading in verse 19. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and he shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So he takes Joseph's bones. Verse 20. And they took the journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them uh, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So God leads them during the day in a pillar of a cloud, and then by night in a pillar of fire. To give them light and keep them warm um, in the desert at night it gets very cold days are super hot but then at night it'll get extremely cold it's, it's just an interesting environment and so god provides a cloud for them i mean that's shade during the day and it's leading them around imagine you know the children of israel just following a cloud right 
Imagine all the, the, the people around it. Look at these goofballs. They're following a cloud around. What are they doing? Like, don't they know clouds just float around? All the, like, what, why are they picking that cloud? I mean, there's a cloud over there, right? Um, and then at night, there's this, I guess, a pillar of fire, um, some sort of fireball or something um, that would uh, lead them during the night and would keep them warm and uh, give them light as well. And that's a representation of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is called a fire. Uh, in the New Testament, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down, it's a rushing mighty wind, right? So it's like a picture of um, the Holy Spirit, which helps to lead us, helps to guide us. It comforts us. The Holy Spirit comforts us as well. And that's a representation of the Holy Spirit. Well, they're traveling through, and, and God's already given them these things, and they're not yet to the Red Sea. Now, I don't know how long, how long it was from Egypt till they made it to the Red Sea crossing, um, but I do know that it took a little bit of time for them to get there. Now, how many people were there traveling together? Let's see if I can, uh, I didn't write the verse down. Oh, here we go. It's in chapter 12 in verse number 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. So 600,000 men. Well, back then, most of the men, uh, men in, in the Bible would mean over 20 years of age was when they were recognized as a man in that society at that time. And so uh, probably of the 600,000, I mean, I would think at least 500,000 were married. I mean, uh, a lot of them would be. So then you have their wives and also then you have children. Now, back then, the families were much, much larger than we have today. Mm -hmm. um, today, the average is like, you know, two and a half kids or less than that, you know, per, per family. Um, interesting average, half a kid, you know, uh, averages. But um, they don't have half kids. Everyone has a whole kid. It's just how the averages works. I had to explain that because you know, some people don't understand. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, and so back then, it was more like probably eight or 10 children per family, you know? Um, they just, they multiplied and they didn't have some of the things that we have today. They didn't have abortion, praise God. They didn't have birth control, things like that. And so they just had more children. And uh, so the families you can imagine were very large. So if there's 500,000 families and each family, let's say, is 10 in their family, husband, wife, eight kids, you know, that's five million people, right? Mm -hmm. So you could easily see how this is a big, big, large group. And that kind of puts it in perspective. Think about, let's say, just two or three million people. Think about how much man it would take to feed that many people. How much water it would take to, you don't feed people water, you, I don't know, how do you, you drink like, it? You, you, thirsty? you give people water to drink, there we go. Um, that's a lot of water coming out of a rock, right? And what's interesting about the rock too, so the water comes out of the rock, the rock follows them around everywhere <laughs> they go. Can you imagine? You're following a cloud during the day, and then you've got this large boulder <laughs> just rolling around. By, like, did they have to throw it in a wagon? I mean, it just seems like it fo the rock followed them, right? And that rock is Jesus Christ. You know, maybe the rock led them. Maybe it was in the front. I don't know. Um, but they got this massive rock following them everywhere they go. And then whenever they want to drink, water comes out of it. Um, interesting, right? And so it's just amazing how the Lord provides for his people as he leads them through the wilderness. Now, let's remember that. We're not meant as Christians to spend our whole life in the wilderness. Um, there was some neat things that happened in the wilderness, but they didn't conquer any giants in the wilderness. They didn't have any blessings. They didn't have the promised land of milk and honey. Um, they had hot sand during the day and lots of problems. They weren't settled. They were constantly moving. Um, we were, helped Miss uh, Patty move yesterday, and that's okay to do once. But if you, if you call me next week and say, hey, Pastor, I'm moving again, and then the week after that, hey, Pastor, I'm moving again, I'm going to get pretty tired of moving. Um, at some point, I'm going to be like, you just need to stay in one place, right? And so constantly moving, everyday traveling um, is not fun. Um, and so the wilderness, although they had some miracles, is not where God's people are meant to stay. We're supposed to make it to the promised land. And we'll get to the Red Sea and more into the traveling around in the following weeks. But thank you for coming to Sunday School. We've got about 16 minutes till the service. We'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord God, we love you. We need you. Thank you for those who came to hear uh, teaching from your precious holy word today, God. Lord, we love you. We need you. Help the service go well here in just a few minutes. Um, and uh, give us just a great day at church today, Lord. We love you. need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.